Welcome. This is Fundamentals of Micro and Nanofabrication. My name is Sushobhan Avasti from IC Bangalore. And today we are going to discuss uh, the next chapter in our ongoing series on physical vapor deposition. We shall look at sputtering. And this is under the larger module of additive processing. So the basic idea of sputtering was something that we covered in the introductory lecture that we started with. Uh, let me grab my pointer. And the idea is fairly simple. So once again, we have plasma. So you might be seeing a theme here, right? That whenever we have to provide energy, we can either provide energy thermally. So evaporation was an example of that. But another another thing that is often tried is to provide the, elect the energy electrically through either a pla through some through the formation of plasma, either through DC or RF, right? So sputtering is essentially a version of that. So you're doing physical vapor deposition, but the energy is not being provided thermally, but electrically. So plasma, as you know, is nothing but ionized gas. So in this case, we start with argon. I, I uh, you could have chosen another gas, but argon is just an inert gas and also a heavy gas. So it suffices. So we have argon, and because it's a plasma, this is ionized, ar ionized argon. And uh, you f and there is an anode and a cathode. The argon being positively charged uh, is attracted to the cathode. And it comes with some amount of speed, right? It's because it comes with some amount of acceleration, and it bangs on the surface of the cathode. This banging is... Um, strong enough or hard enough that certain particles get ejected from the metal surface or the, so the target surface. In some sense, it's very similar to if you take a hammer and you start beating on a surface, say a wooden surface, or you start beating on a stone surface, you will see chips flying out, right? So it is uh, exactly the same process but having at a microscopic level. So, uh, so individual uh, atoms or clusters of atoms get ejected. These don't have any charge. Uh, they are neutral, so they are not unaffected by this electric field. They just go from high concentration to low concentration, which tends, to, which means they go from target to the substrate. This process is often line of sight uh, and related to mean free path and a few other things that we have discussed before. Um, this process is fairly inefficient of argon bombardment, so most of the energy actually goes as thermal energy. So you must have some water cooling to cool the target down, otherwise the target starts heating up and in fact even melting in extreme cases. Um, there are certain groundings to make sure the electric field lines are contained and there are certain things, additional things that are done to make sure that plasma is self-sustaining, but those are details we shall look at later. For now, uh, the question I have for you is, have you seen this before? Like where in your day-to-day -day life do you interact with plasma? And to give you a hint, uh, this is what a plasma looks like. So this is an actual photograph of a sputtering gun and this glow that you see is actually the glow due to the plasma that has formed on top of this sputtering gun. Uh, this pink layer is basically the metal target which is getting bombarded. So this is, it looks like a ring but it's actually a so whole surface. This whole surface is getting bombarded with, with argon. So where have you seen this before? Well, this is what, the, what is the concept behind fluorescent light. Uh, this is nothing but a uh, cathode ray tubes in which ionized gases bombard the surface, thereby emitting light. Uh, so the same energy is being used here for deposition. The simplest sputtering and probably the oldest sputtering is DC sputtering. Uh, the idea here is very simple. You apply a very large bias. Uh, the bias is high enough to actually cause uh, the air to break down. In order to understand where does, how does the plasma form and where do the argon plus ions come for, from in the first place, we have to understand what, uh, we have to understand the mechanism in a little bit more detail, okay? So to do sputtering, what you need is argon plus ions, right? And argon plus ions don't exist because what you flow inside the chamber is un uncharged or neutral argon gas, which is nothing but just a collection of argon atoms, right? So we need some source of energy to actually strip out an electron from this argon atom so that it forms the argon ion. That source is typically the electron, okay? But that's a chicken and egg problem, right? Where do you get the electron? So the way it works is that an argon, uncharged argon atom interacts with a very high speed electron causing it to ionize and then forms two, ex two electrons. So it starts with one electron and forms one extra electrons. Now, this is in some sense a sort of a chain reaction type mechanism where the emergence of one electron causes an amplification. And so you have several electrons or several electrons cause cascading ionizations. And ultimately, if this whole thing is self-sustaining or above a certain critical uh, 
uh, critical size, it would become self-sustaining and plasma. And once you have these argon plus ions, you already have the electric field, the argon plus ions react to that electric field and come bombarding on the surface, uh, very much like ion implantation, though the energies here are much, much lower than ion implantation. And the, uh, then those energy, then those argon atoms sort of knock the structure of the lattice, causing every now and then some uh, atom to get sputtered out, right? So that's the basic idea. Now, if you look at this reaction, uh, what it requires is an energetic electron, like an electron that has been accelerated under electric field for some distance, so it has a lot of energy. Now you can very easily relate this to the mean free path, right? Because we have looked at that under high vacuum and under low vacuum, what is the mean free path? So the maximum energy that the electron or argon plus ion can actually attain within this electric field is limited by what is the mean free path. So if the, uh, if, the, if the gas is very sparse, then your mean free path is long, so they will have a very long time to accelerate under electric field generating a lot of energy. However, if the mean free path is small, they will not have a lot of energy. Just keeping that in mind, let's go next, right? So this is what a typical system looks like uh, of a sputtering chamber. So you have a substrate. This is where you want to do the deposition. This tends to be the positive electrode. You have a target. This is the material you want to deposit. So this is typically the negative electrode. Uh, the bottom and the top electrode geometry doesn't matter. They can be reversed. But as long as this is negative and this is positive. So you apply a DC bias, typically 1 to 3 kilo volt. And uh, this can be DC, it can also be AC, that is called RS sputtering, we'll talk about that later. It can also be pulsed DC sputtering. In fact, lately there is an emergence of a new type of sputtering system which is called high impulse magnetron sputtering. We'll not talk about it, but DC or pulsed DC would both work. The pressure maintained inside the chamber typically is between 10 to 100 millibar. As we shall see, this pressure range is critical for self-sustaining plasma. So what you have is a plasma somewhere in the middle and argon plus ions are coming down, the neutral ejected atoms are going towards the substrate. You need some gas in because you need the source of argon. So the gas, the argon gas is pumped through some MFC uh, from the top and somewhere from the bottom you, uh, you have a pump that maintains the vacuum. Typically the base pressure is maintained at high vacuum conditions, so around 10 to the power minus 6. But because you are continuously flowing argon during the deposition process, the actual pressure is a little higher, around 10 to 100 millibar. Let's first talk about sputtering yield. Uh, sputtering yield, very simply speaking, tells you that for every atom of argon or every ion of argon that is bombarding the surface, how many atoms of the target material are actually coming out. All right. So sputtering yield of 1 means for every atom of argon plus one atom of the target comes out. Okay. Now, as you can imagine, that sputtering yield will change with which inert gas you use. So theoretically, you could use helium, neon, argon, or xenon. But if you were to use helium, you would actually not, not get a very high sputtering yield, and that is simply because helium is a light atom. So it will take a lot more energy or several helium atoms to actually eject one metal particle out from a tar metallic target, which is much heavier. As you go from helium to neon, the sputtering yield increases, argon it increases further, xenon it increases even more. However, xenon tends to be very expensive and for practical reasons is not used. Theoretically, you can use it. Uh, for, every at, for every sputtering atom though, uh, there is a certain threshold which is the minimum energy required to eject an atom that tends to be something, in the, something between 10 to 100 EV. Okay. Now, the sputtering yield does not just depend upon what you are using to do the sputtering, it also depends upon what are you sputtering. So for example, heavy metals like Ag tend to sputter at a lower yield, uh, light materials like aluminum tend to sputter at a high yield. Uh, there is also dependence on theta, so not all uh, the flux of argon plus ions that is coming, not all of them are created equal. Uh, those that are actually uh, at a higher angles can sometimes cause more sputtering to happen. It's uh, without going into unnecessary detail, one of the reasons you can think this might be is because ejection requires uh, sort of a glan glancing deflection and certain angles are a little more probable than others. So it turns out that zero, which is the normal incidence, is not the one that gives you the best, the highest yield. The highest yield is somewhere around 60 degrees and modern sputtering systems take care of this by an elaborate system of uh, magnets that actually tunes the direction at which argon plus ions come. Those are magnets are also needed for something else called magnetron sputtering, but we'll come to that later. Um, 
So yeah, so to summarize this slide, what you are doing sputtering with matters to get higher sputtering yield. Argon is just the most cost effective option we have among the heavy inert nuclei, uh, heavy inert atoms and it also depends on what you are sputtering. So heavy metals tend to sputter more uh, slowly, light metals tend to sputter faster and there is an angle dependence. Now let us talk about this idea that I have been trying to sell to you which is sustained plasma. So it turns out the sustaining of plasma and deposition rate are at loggerheads with each other. So they are not, uh, so they the optimization they are the inverse of each other, all right. So what sustained plasma does not work for, uh, does not provide high deposition rate, okay. So let us first talk about what is sustained plasma and how do you get it. So supposing you are doing DC sputtering and supposing the distance between the electrodes is too small, right. So if the distance between electrode is too small, then there are very few collisions or there are fewer collisions between electrons and argon, right. So there is just a very small distance and if the mean free power, if the gas is sparse enough, it is completely possible that the electron will not encounter any argon atom and hence not do any ionization. If however the argon pressure is too low, again the same problem, so even if the distance is large but the argon concentration is very low because the partial pressure of argon is very low, even then the electron may not encounter an argon atom and hence not cause any ionization. Overall you can say that, that for, for plasma to occur, you need a certain product of L cross P. You need a certain electrode to electrode distance and you need a certain amount of pressure. Empirically that number turns out to be L cross P must be more than 0.6 millibar. Now I think millibar centimeters maybe. <laughs> and now for dense plasma, L and P, the higher the L cross P product, the more dense the plasma. However, for deposition, there is slightly different, there is a slightly different math. You see, the mean free path of air or nitrogen or whatever uh, is around 0.5 centimeters at 50 millibar, okay. So the source atoms, so these are the atoms that are coming out from the target and going towards the substrate, they suffer multiple or hundreds of collisions before they actually reach the substrate. So even say if your substrate to target distance is 10 centimeters and your mean free path is 0.5 centimeters, then in order to go from point A to point B, it must suffer around 50 collisions, right? Oh sorry, uh, it must suffer around 20 collisions. So that each collision is a, can be a glancing ion collision and just like in evaporation rate, each collision reduces the material uh, usage this and leads to lower deposition rate, same say in sputtering, each collision sort of reduces the probability of this neutral atom making its way to the target, uh, so making its way to the substrate and reduces the deposition rate. So for high deposition rate, you hence want this L to be as small as possible. However, you also, uh, or uh, L to be as small as possible or this P to be as small as possible. So rate is inversely proportional to the L cross P product, right. So for sustained plasma, you want L cross P product to be large. For high deposition rate, you want L cross P product to be small. These are opposing requirements, right. And that is one of the reasons why it is very hard to get reasonable deposition rates as high as in evaporation in simple sputtering systems. This is the same thing is being uh, uh, demonstrated in this uh, on this very nice graph from a book by Milton Oring. This book is by the way freely available on the web uh, as, an under, as an e-book by the publisher. I urge you to read it, it is a remarkable read. So this is the same thing that we just discussed is shown here. So you have uh, sputtering yield and relative deposition rate on the right hand side. Uh, you are looking at the current which is nothing but ion flux uh, inside the sputtering chamber on the left hand side. And you see that under typical sputtering conditions, you actually get this U-shaped curve, right. At very small argon pressure, you do not have, uh, you have high sputtering yield but you do not have, uh, you do not have enough plasma or enough discharge current, sorry, you have large discharge current but you do not have enough sputtering yield. And at very high pressures, you have a lot of sputtering yield but you do not have any discharge current which means you do not have any plasma. Optimum lies somewhere in the middle, so for typical simple uh, sputtering, you always have to be in this range of around 80 to 140 millitor. 
and the maximum deposition rates you can get is 10 nanometers per minute which is relatively low. Now this would have been the end of the matter except people are smart. So somebody ca uh, came up with the idea of using magnet to enhance or change this optimization. So the basic idea is simple if you attach a magnet, a uh, magnet affects charged particles in a very predictable fashion which is the charged particles tend to go in spiral or circular paths in a magnetic field. So using that what you can actually do is you can make the plasma inside the chamber non-uniform. You can force such that the argon plus atoms or electrons, oh sorry not argon plus atoms, the electrons can be forced to stay closer to one of the electrodes. Uh, so locally the concentration of electrons can be enhanced at the expense of a lower concentration of electrons somewhere else. So instead of a uniform plasma now you have a biased plasma where electrons are all tightly confined close to the one electrode and that electrode tends to be the target. So by forcing the electrons to be very close to the target you have now artificially enhanced the concentration of electrons without actually changing the pressure right. So uh, looking into detail this is what the typical sputtering gun looks like. So it has magnets, so it has north and south magnets, the magnetic field lines go radially outwards. So this is the top view. So this is the, this is, you are looking face down at a target, right? So the target normally is coming towards out of the screen and magnetic field lines are going in the radial direction, okay? Looking from the side, this is what it looks like. So magnetic field lines are coming out. So this is a plus sign and electric field is in this direction. So the electrons are pushed in the opposite direction. So you can just do V cross B and it will tell you that the electrons will now be forced to go in a circular path which is given by this, by this line. Because radial magnetic field, these electrons will actually go through, go on a circular path along this, this magnetic field. Okay. So looking from the top, it will look circular. Looking from the side, it will be as if the electron is jumping and going around the target. This is a 3D view of what we just discussed. So whether the target is circular, rectangle, doesn't matter, but there was, there's a path. There's a path of electrons actually hopping on. And when you look at a used a sputtering target, uh, you can actually see these erosion lines. These erosion lines represent the path of the electron where most of the electrons are confined. Okay. Now, wherever the electrons are confined, that is the area where a lot of plasma will happen simply because the electron have a high probability of colliding with an argon uh, atom and forming the argon plus ion and that argon plus ion will then bombard the substrate to eject more material so you get these erosion lines there. Now one question to ask is what level of magnetic field do you need and uh, doesn't the magnetic field also affect the argon plus atom, right? It's, it's uh, ion, it's not just affecting electrons, as much also affect the argon plus ion. So for that, let's go to some basic physics. The bending radius under a magnetic field satisfies this relation. At around VD of 100 volts and uh, magnetic field of around 100 Gauss, you can calculate that the radius of electron is 0.3 centimeters. So that's a very small number, right? So the electrons are very tightly confined, but the radius of uh, rotation for argon plus atoms is 91 centimeter. That's a very long or very large circle. Practically speaking, for typical substrate uh, tar uh, target distances, the argon plus ions are essentially going straight. Right? I mean, they are taking such, they have such a small curvature that for all practical purposes is negligible. So the B, the magnetic field is purposefully chosen to be a value that argon plus ions are barely affected but the electrons are confined and the reason the, dif the reason the difference between these two simply comes from the mass. Argon plus ions are much heavier so it's much harder to bend them. Electrons are much lighter, it's much easier to bend them. So what is the net effect of magnetron versus non-magnetron sputtering? So that is what is there in this figure. So if the maximum you could get with a non-magnetron sputtering was around 10 nanometers per minute and you need it to be at around 100 millitore pressure, introduction of a magnet A reduces the pressure to around 1 millitore or so and also allows you much higher deposition rate of around 1000 nanometers per minute which is a significant improvement for very minimal cost. A lot of these magnets that are there in sputtering chambers are simple neodymium magnets which are relatively cheap and easy to install. Next let's talk a little bit about RS sputtering. What is it and why is it required? Uh, 
So till now we have discussed DC sputtering and you can imagine it will work perfectly fine for targets that are conducting but for targets that are insulating, supposing silicon dioxide or even aluminum oxide, they may not work very well because most of the voltage would be would fall across the thick insulator so there would just not be enough voltage across the plasma to do any ionization right so all the voltage will be drawn across the insulator um, or to think another way what will simply happen is all the bombarding argon plus atoms would create a positive charge on the surface and unlike a conducting material which will discharge uh, uh, the, the discharge and remove that charge away an insulator cannot do that so all that positive charge will pile up on top surface of the target and that positive charge will then prevent fergan, uh, further argon plus at ions to bombard so ultimately the plasma will extinguish or the sputtering will stop because the target will just charge up the simplest solution to this conundrum is to not use dc bias is to use rf bias or an oscillating bias so uh, as you would know that uh, a capacitor cannot conduct DC current but a capacitor can conduct AC current so uh, using RF uh, by dumping RF uh, power instead of DC power you can actually create plasma even on insulating targets. So often for oxides, nitrides or any material that you tend that you expect to charge up a lot you can use RF sputtering. Okay. Now what frequency are we talking about? So at very low frequencies, say around 100 kilohertz, both ions and electrons react to switching voltages uh, because the here the speeds are slow enough that heavy argon and light electron both can uh, respond. At high frequency, which is more than a megahertz, ions cannot keep up. The argon, uh, the inertia of argon plus becomes so large that the rate at which you are switching the bias is so fast that only electrons are able to react. The argon plus ions just stop reacting. Typically RF sputtering is done at 13.5 megahertz which is in this regime okay. So only electrons react argon plus ions do not and that has important consequences. So here is one important consequence. Uh, what is the how do you at all get a deposition right. So because if you really think about it for half the cycle you are bombarding the target with argon plus ions right. In the other half of the cycle, the bias reverses, right? So now bombarding the substrate with argon plus ions. So all things being equal, you deposit in one half of the cycle, you etch in the other half of the cycle. Why should there be any net deposition, right? Why should at all there be net deposition? The answer is that the things are a little more complicated. There is a th there is a reason why we have selected the frequency, the RF frequency, to be more than one megahertz. So in this regime argon plus ions are not reacting. So they do not necessarily see an oscillating electric field or rather they see it but they are unable to react. So they cannot go left, they cannot go right, they cannot move that fast. So what ends up happening is all the argon plus ions sort of accumulate in the middle. Okay. Electrons on the other do react. So electrons go left when the voltage changes uh, in one half of the cycle and electrons go right when the voltage switches in the other half of the cycle. So electrons are sort of going back and forth, the argon plus ions are stuck in the middle. So if you were to plot a DC voltage, it would look something like this. Now this is interesting, you have not applied a DC voltage, you have applied an AC voltage. However, because of the difference in inertia between argon plus and electrons, a DC voltage has been induced because all the argon plus ions are concentrated in the middle. So the voltage here is positive and of course the voltage falls to zero. So the net DC voltage from left to right is still zero, right? There is no DC bias it's a, because you are only applying an AC bias but somewhere in the middle of the chamber you have a positive DC voltage. And now this is called the induced steady state DC potential and it depends upon the design of the chamber and a few other details. Now even though we have this DC potential it still begs the question how at all we are getting a deposition because you see in half of the cycle the targets get sputtered, in half of the cycle the electrode gets sputtered. Because you have the same voltage on both the source and the substrate you are depositing in one cycle and etching in the cycle and if both of them are equal processes you will not have a net deposition. This is a symmetric case. In a symmetric case you cannot have a net deposition, right? So how does that get solved? Well, that gets solved by a very, very simple thing and that is 
by changing the electrode area. So, the target the electrode of the target and the electrode the area the area of the target and the area of the substrate are not kept the same. And if you look at electrostatics, all the math of the electrostatics scales with uh, area. So, if your Subs if your uh, uh, sub area of your substrate is A substrate and area of the target is A target, then the voltage that you would actually get, the induced DC voltage that you would actually get at this target and the substrate would also be different and it scales with area ratio to the power 4. So, it is a very strong dependence, a very strong polynomial dependence. So, this dotted line is the case where both electrodes have the same area, both the substrate and the target. This red line represents the real case where the electrode areas are scaled in a manner so that there is a very large voltage drop that happens towards the target which, where, which is where you want the sputtering to happen and a very small voltage drop at the substrate where you want the deposition to happen. This voltage is smaller, this voltage is larger, so this acceleration is more, so here the erosion is more. Right? So, in order to do the deposition, wherever whatever is the target has to be small. So, small target means large voltage, large target, large area means small voltage. So, just by scaling the area, we are able to create a preferential deposition. So, go, uh, I urge you to go and look at your sputtering systems. You will always see that the chuck or the hold, the sample holder of a sputtering system will have a larger area than the sputtering gun. Okay. Um, now, let us talk about some energies. So, because of this V substrate and V target, there is some amount of argon plus bombardment even on the substrate. Right? So, while most of the bombardment is happening on the target where you want it to happen, but with RF bias some amount of bombardment happens even on the substrate. And that argon plus bombardment depends upon what this voltage is. In typical sputterings that is around 20 EV or 20 volts. You can add some additional DC bias on top of this RF bias to enhance it up to 100 to 500 EV. And this energy is often used in sputtering to change the properties of the deposited film because this is one additional source of energy, right? Just like substrate temperature is a source of energy for moving things around, the bombardment of these ions is also a source of energy to move things around. Now, this is the ion energy, right? This is the energy that is coming to the substrate due to argon plus bombardment, due to this voltage substrate. Now, the neutral metal atoms that are getting ejected from the target are also coming with some amount of speed. Right? That energy all tends to be in the range of 2 to 20 EV. So, that is one more source of energy that you have to play to change the properties of the film that you are depositing. Now, exactly what this number is, it really depends on the substrate to target distance and mean free path, which is another way of saying pressure. So, higher pressure means this energy is low, lower pressure means this energy is high. So, if you are getting a lot of cracking in your film because you feel that there is a lot of bombardment like the, um, uh, the, the metals, the neutral species are coming with a lot of energy, all you have to do is increase the sputtering pressure and that energy will reduce. If you think they are not coming with enough energy and you want more crystallite, crystallites to form or you want the grain size to increase, maybe you should reduce the pressure and that allows you to come with more energy and that more energy can then be used to increase the crystallinity of the film. Okay. Now, one point to do, do is to compare this energy with what you get when you do evaporation. So, in evaporation, the energy levels were like 0.1 EV. In sputtering, there are several EV. So, they are order of magnitude or maybe two orders of magnitude higher and that excess energy is key. That is why sputtering can give you so much, uh, such a different morphology than evaporation. A point on sputtering alloy, if you remember when we discussed evaporation, I mentioned that it is very hard to evaporate alloys because things tend to come out in the ratio of the vapor pressure, not in the ratio of composition. Sputtering does not have the problem. It is a very interesting uh, mathematical exercise to prove to yourself that sputtering, uh, can, uh, that sputtering can do alloys without, uh, without change in composition. Uh, Milton O'Ring's book actually does this very nicely in his, in his uh, yeah, it does it very nicely in one of the chapters. I would not include that discussion as part of this curricula, so I am not going to discuss it. I will just leave this fact that sputtering does maintain the stoichiometry composition. So, unlike evaporation, you can have a nichrome alloy target and expect to get nichrome on the substrate. Reactive sputtering uh, is another great advantage of sputtering. So, 
the basic idea of reactive sputtering is that you introduced some uh, other gas such as oxygen or nitrogen and that reacts with the uh, with the uh, with these neutral species and to form new species so for example you can use an aluminum target introduce some oxygen in the plasma and hope to deposit aluminum oxide or you have a titanium target introduced ammonia or nitrogen into the chamber and expect to deposit titanium nitride so this is often done to deposit various types of metal oxides nitrides carbides you name it and it's very useful all right reactive sputtering uh, because it does some amount of reaction, it's not just a physical vapor deposition process, the process parameters are a little more complicated. Um, for example, you may have to worry about how much oxygen to flow uh, and if you don't flow enough oxygen, you may not get stoichiometric films. So here an example, we are looking at, uh, at the deposition of tantalum nitrite from a tantalum target. And depending upon what was the partial pressure of nitrogen maintained inside, you would actually get different versions of titanium nitride. And these versions would have different resistivity and different properties. Some discussion on the nucleation and growth in during the sputtering would be useful. So if you remember, we looked at, uh, we, we, we looked at a similar diagram for evaporation where we have three zones. We had zone 1, zone T and zone 2. And at that point, and the difference between those three zones was substrate temperature. With sputtering, you have access to sput substrate temperature as one of the parameters, but your parameter space is larger. You also have access to pressure. And as we have discussed, the pressure changes the energy at which the neutral atoms are coming to the surface. Um, so this also actually, because this is an additional and significant source of energy, this also changes the microstructure just like the substrate temperature does. So unlike the case of evaporation, the phase diagram of a sputtering system is two-dimensional. Okay. Now first let's look at this, uh, at this axis because this axis is very similar to what you see in evaporation, where if you are below 30% uh, of melting point, you tend to be in zone 1 and then uh, transition into zone T and if you uh, are at more than 0.5 uh, times the melting point, then you tend to be in a highly crystalline zone 2. Okay. And the reason for that is obvious as you are going to higher, higher temperature, you are providing more and more energy for surface diffusion, which allows the incoming atoms to rearrange themselves and get into the lattice position and give you a more crystalline film. And in zone T, there is this competitive growth that happens where uh, some one or two orientations sort of kinetically win over the other. So initially you have different types of orientations, but if you grow thick enough film, one or two orientations will win out. Now the thing to understand additionally, more compli the, the complication that is on top of that is the effect of pressure. So as you increase the pressure, the mean free path becomes smaller as the mean free path becomes smaller the atoms suffer more collisions and thereby lose more energy so as you reduce the pressure you increase the energy of the incoming atoms at because they have higher energy they can do what could have been done at a high temperature right so at the same uh, the one way to think about it as you are reducing the pressure the temperature at which you do zone t tends to reduce because you have now higher energy. And that higher energy means you don't need to get that energy from substrate, you now are getting that energy from the electrical power. So all that happens is that this zone, the, the range of zone 1 reduces, becomes narrower, the zone T comes to lower temperatures, the zone 2 comes to lower temperatures, and zone 3 comes to lower temperatures. Uh, so this is how people sort of play with morphology of the deposited film given uh, access to pressure and temperature these conditions become significantly more complex when you are trying to do reactive sputtering but that is something that I, we will not discuss in this course with that let me just conclude uh, start to conclude and uh, firstly just discuss some advantages and disadvantages of sputtering so the great advantage of sputtering is this large size targets are possible so if you remember when we were discussing evaporation we had point sources we have crucibles we have resistance but we didn't have things that were very large in size and that meant that we always had this uh, optimization issue of substrate to target distance versus uniformity. In sputtering, because of the way the sputter gun is made, you can uh, make arbitrarily large targets and that means you can make arbitrarily large areas for uniform deposition. Uh, 
when you do this, you still have to be careful that in order to make sure that most of the voltage drop happens uh, near the target, the chuck or the substrate must size must also increase, but that is often easily done. Another advantage is better control, more reproducible films and especially more reproducible alloy deposition. Evaporation does not allow you to do alloy, sputtering does. You can do in situ cleaning. Um, because you have a plasma and you remember the lecture on dry cleaning where we were using plasma to clean the substrates. Well, here we have plasma in situ, so you can just change some parameters, change the direction of electric field and thereby clean your substrate before you start the deposition. There are no x-rays generated because there are no electron beams and you do get better stub coverage partly because the mean free paths are much shorter which means the arrival angle of the flux is much more wide so it actually tends to deposit in all directions like it's, it's less directional than evaporation. And finally, you can control frame stress because you have this additional parameter which is the energy of the incoming atoms. And by changing the voltage, changing the energy of that incoming atom, you can actually change the stress. The disadvantages are that it's a much more expensive process. The rate of depositions are relatively lower. Evaporation can be very, very high. Physical bombardments tend to degrade soft materials. So if you're trying to deposit on top of, say, an organic semiconductor, sputtering creates a lot of damage. Evaporation does not. Um, more impurities because you are you tend to function at higher pressures, which basically means that the the incorporation of uh, these of argon and other impurities into the film tend to be higher. And better step coverage basically means uh, you don't have you don't have very sharp profiles, which is a problem for liftoff, as we shall discuss uh, a few lectures later. With that, let me one put one slides of comparison between evaporation and sputtering because this is an opt this is a dis decision that you often have to make which one to choose. Uh, the energy type in evaporation is thermal, in sputtering it's mechanical. The rate in evaporations can be very high. Sputtering tends to be a little lower. However, the impact energy of evaporation is very low. Sputtering is a little higher, which allows you to get the same quality of films at much lower temperature, just like we discussed in the Thornton diagrams. <clears throat> the density of films in evaporation is low. In sputtering, you can create it high because by just bombarding the surface, you can enhance the density. Uh, the adhesion of films can sometimes be low in evaporation. In sputtering is usually good, again, because it's a bombarding type of process. It tends to have good adhesion. The substrate uh, does not heat much in evaporation. It can heat in sputtering uh, because of the bombardment of argon plus ions, especially during RF sputtering. Uh, the surface da uh, damage during evaporation is minimal because the energy of the incoming atoms is so low in sputtering it is significant. Uh, in situ cleaning at is not an option without additional hardware in sputtering it is. Uh, the vacuum here tends to be higher, sputtering the vacuum tends to be low vacuum which basically means the directionality is very very high in evaporation not so much from sputtering which means that the step coverage is poor in evaporation very good in sputtering. Purity is higher in evaporation because of the lower pressures sputtering it is lower because of the lower pressures, sorry, uh, of the high pressures. The temperature of the target, uh, this is the target, this is the material that you are transporting. So this is melted, right? So you have uh, melted, which means that you have limited choice of materials. Materials that are very hard to melt cannot be deposited. The stoichiometric control is poor. However, in substrate, in sputtering, the target becomes a little hot but beca because the water cooling stays more or less at room temperatures. And that allows you in almost infinite choice of material. It doesn't, you can, you can sputter tungsten, you can sputter refractive materials, you can sputter carbides, you can sputter very nitrites, materials that have very high melting point. You can't evaporate those materials. The technology for evaporation is very simple. Even a simple student can typically maintain a evaporator. Sputtering takes a little bit more work. The controllability is though better. Scale up is a little easier in sputtering. And those are the reasons why sputtering has won out in CMOS processing. Last slide on a related or a cousin to uh, sputtering, which is pulse laser depositions. In a lot of ways, pulse laser deposition is a cross between evaporation and sputtering. It has advantages of both. So the basic idea is that uh, here the energy is being provided by a laser beam. The laser beam is pulsed, hence the pulsed laser deposition. And this is a very high power laser. So it falls on a target and it is absorbed in the first few nanometers. And the energy is so high that the first few nanometers are instantly sublime or ablate. And they don't just ablate, but their electrons are stripped away, so they ionize. So they actually form a laser plume which has plasma and gases. And that laser plume expands, 
deposits on the substrate and extinguishes. There is no sustained plasma here because it's just one shot. But then another shot of laser comes in, another shot of laser comes in. So every time you sort of evaporate or ablate the top few nanometers of the target, which gives you an amazing amount of stoichiometric control. Um, there are uh, which allows you to deposit films that are otherwise very hard to deposit during sputtering and evaporation. But there, uh, the things to notice, however, here is that the laser uh, tends to be very intense. So the intensity of the laser tends to be in joules per centimeter square, uh, so which is a very high amount of power in a very small area. Also, scale up is a little issue. Uh, even commercially, commercially, very few tools are available that can do uniform deposition over six inches. So that's a challenge. It's still an R&D tool, not so much a commercial tool. Uh, with that, we come to the end of the discussion on sputtering. Uh, next, we shall look into a little bit more detail of the art of metallization. So, we, uh, through evaporation and sputtering, we know how to deposit metals, but there is a little bit more processing information that you have to understand in order to make good contacts to devices. So, we will we'll have one lecture which, which we shall devote to that. We shall also understand issues such as electromigration. Thank you.